The Leap Foundation proudly presents the Meet the Mentor podcast with Dr. Bill Dorfman. Dr. Bill is a TV host, New York Times bestselling author, two-time Guinness World Book record holder, fitness guru, celebrity cosmetic dentist, and philanthropist, cosmetic dentist, and philanthropist who founded the Leap Foundation. Here's Dr. Bill. Hey, Dr. Bill here. So I'm super excited. Leap is coming together. We're still going to try and do a live component of it. Um, we're looking at different venues. UCLA is definitely out, but there are some theaters in LA. So we may have 50 to 100 students. So if you haven't signed up yet, definitely come virtually, hopefully come live. This is for local LA people only because we're not going to be having, you know, the dormitory and all that. That'll all happen again in 2022. Uh, LEAP will be July 18th to the 24th, and we'll have amazing speakers. You know, in the past, we've had Mark Wahlberg, Anthony Hopkins, Paula Abdul, Michael Strahan, Jason Alexander, um, uh, Usher, Pentatonix. I mean, on and on and on and on. Um, also, I'm excited because the man who helps me do my podcast just told me we're breaking ground here. We are in the top 2% of all podcasts worldwide. And there's something like 2 million podcasts out there. So that's really exciting too. Uh, my guest today is super special. Why do we do these Meet the Mentors? Here's the deal. Leap is a life-changing experience. And it always culminates on Friday with a mentor workshop. In the mentor workshop, you get an opportunity to literally sit and talk to professionals from all walks of life. And we thought, you know, this is too good to just do once a year. So basically what we're doing is we're interviewing different people, doctors, lawyers, educators, philanthropists, firefighters, you name it, all throughout the year so that you get to meet these amazing, exciting people and learn from them. And the thing that differentiates our podcast from other ones is you're going to walk away with some really great pearls of knowledge and things that you can really implement when you decide to go into business. Now, Sabrina Kay, who we're going to introduce in a second, is going to use three different businesses that she started. And she started multiple businesses and they've all been successful um, to kind of give you examples of things that she's done in completely different fields. So let me give you a little bit of info on Sabrina. Sabrina is a veteran CEO, tech educator, board member, public speaker, and philanthropist. She's currently the CEO of Fremont Private Investments chairman of After School All-Stars, and a board member of Mankind and Yellow Brick Company. She'll tell you what those are. She was the founder and CEO of the Art Institute of Hollywood and Fremont College, founding vice chair of Premier Business Bank and CEO of Dale Carnegie Los Angeles. Dr. K's charitable work was recognized by California Senate as Woman of the Year, by the United Nations. And Dr. K received her joint doctorate degree in work-based learning leadership at Wharton School and Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. She holds doubles master's degrees, an MBA from USC and an MSc in higher education from University of Pennsylvania. All, of course, with the highest of honors. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to my friend, Sabrina Kay. Hi, how are you? I'm great. And I hear that that virtual background behind you is actually your living room and it's gorgeous. Oh, thank you. It is, uh, it is my living room and you can see the ocean's not moving because it's a virtual background. I mean, yeah. So Sabrina, you've started up multiple businesses. I mean, you're literally a powerhouse uh, and you know you were complimenting me and saying oh bill everything you do you've got the Midas touch I mean you have the Midas touch I, I mean it's amazing the different things that you've done and I'd like you to share with these students 
what it is that you really think is your secret sauce? You know, I think God gives us talent. And that talent is not something that you're just good at. You are better than anybody. So you are so good that no one else can even compete in within that, you know, that game because you are the best. And for brand building, it's a Bill Dorfman. Like no one can even come close to you. Mine is um, actually hard work. And I jokingly say that I can outwork anybody because I sleep four hours a day and I can really focus myself for a very long time. I grew up in South Korea. So my um, kind of nature of personality is I'm a rule follower. Unlike you, I'm not you know, as good at thinking outside of the box maybe, or uh, just, you know, not doing what exactly it was written. Um, but because of that, I was able to get into a lot of compliance businesses. Because Well, let, of- let's start, let's start with the Art Institute, you know, yeah. I mean, why don't you talk about how you formed that? What actually, first, tell our students exactly what the Art Institute is and then how you formed it and how you made it successful. So Art Institute was the Art Institute of Hollywood, actually. It started as a California design college, was the first computer-aided fashion design college in the country. And uh, I started out of a garage space in Koreatown and became one of the big four in the country uh, within, within a decade. The reason why I was able to do that is because of being resourceful. Uh, And I think, you know, when you put resourcefulness, focus, and, and, you know, your core competency, you put these three ingredients together, you're kind of like bound to make it. And I saw computers coming into the fashion industry. And I thought, this is really going to be the future of the fashion industry. And I love computers and I love technology ever since I was in college. I dropped out of college. So I just went to freshman year in college and I went to see the uh, CEO of the company who made the software. And the way I got to that, uh, that CEO is just really a funny story. I made a cold call out of a newspaper uh, article you know, when you, when you read a newspaper article at the end, oh, for more information, call whatever, right? So right. I called him number and the CEO told me later that as he was walking by, he saw the receptionist who went to the bathroom and did not answer the phone. So he picked up the phone. So I, I got, I mean, it was out of a weird luck when, um, when you are determined and it's meant to be, I think the universe conspires to help you. And that was my luck with the universe. So I went to see that CEO. And before that, I obviously did a lot of research of the company and what their pain points are and how I could be helpful. And the thing is, software is great. It's one of the best softwares. They didn't have the sales team that's really needed. And obviously, they totally were missing the market share in the Korean garment industry. And I'm Korean. So I went to the Korean garment industry and asked them why they're not using the computers. And a lot of them said, oh, it's too expensive. We don't have anyone who knows how to use computers. So my light bulb went out and I said, what if I teach you how to use the computers? And what if I give you computer operators and then you can also get your return on your investment within six months because you can really you know, get rid of a lot of the um, brain damage that you're having with employees and, and designers and, you know, making three samples to choose one, it, the cost is enormous. And so wait, wait, let me back up and summarize. So basically, you heard about this new technology in using computers for designing and fashion and whatnot. And then you took this to people that were already in the clothing business saying, hey, why don't you start using computers instead of doing it the old way? And out of that, you realize there's a niche here that needs to be filled. I want to start a school, basically, where I'm going to be teaching people how to design and how to manufacture, 
not by drawing everything but by hand, but actually by using computers to do everything. And that was kind of the birth of the Art Institute of Hollywood. Right. And I, you know, I, I did exactly the same pitch, not as eloquently as you did, uh, to the president that when I met with him. And he donated about a million dollars worth of software to me to start the college. Wow. So you started this. And how long did you actually own and operate that? So I, you know, financed it with, with a credit card because I didn't know how to raise money. I, you know, that's crazy. I did crazy. the same thing. Seriously? With I had 20 different credit cards. Um, yeah. That's I how I started one, one credit card to the next. Fear is a, such a great motivator, right? The next payment comes up, you have to make money. Otherwise, we're paying 18%, especially at that time. I started in 1992. So Wow. That, that fear just really drove me. And I think that's one of the reasons why I don't sleep that much and I, my body can take it because it's just so used to it. Um, so for the next 10 years, I just worked. I was never sick. I was never, you know, never took a vacation. I never went to nightclub, never drank, never smoked, never had any recreational drugs, never had a casual sex. So it was just all focus on my business. Wait, I have to tell you something. You're just like me. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't go to clubs. I've never taken drugs. I, I sleep five or six hours a night. And I, I was saying this to one of my employees the other day. I've been practicing dentistry now for, it will almost be 40 years, right? And you I've, never, I, I've <laughs> never called in sick once. Yeah. I've never, ever missed a day of work because I was sick. Not once. Yeah. So when you have that focus and discipline and you, you're in your zone of your talent, that you, something that you're really good at, you're really passionate about, I think anyone can make almost anything. And but I, let me ask you something. I mean, y you did what I did, but just in a different industry. Like I saw a need in tooth whitening. You saw a need in a very well-established industry. Tooth whitening was, not, I mean, dentistry, yes, was a well-established industry. Tooth whitening was brand new. So basically we both took a brand new product to a very established industry and yeah. kind of, you know, made a, a revelation in, in that industry. And so you then started a, a teaching institute, right? Well, so I sold that company, um, you know, the public, publicly traded company owner came and wanted to buy it because they could merge. And a lot of people don't understand why public companies pay actually more for the private companies. At that time, P ratio was a 21. So what that means is they can pay the multiples of, let's say, 11 to buy my company and they merge it into publicly traded company, then they make the overcharge of the difference, right? So they can double the value the next day. So I was right. able to sell my company at a very, very high price. And then the company eventually was sold to Goldman Sachs. So, you know, it was my first business was a home run because when I sold it, because I had no debt, I didn't know how to finance. I didn't know how to do employee options. I owned 100% of the company. And I had a $2,000 in copy machine uh, as a debt. So on our you know, exhibit D of, of the debt, that was $2,000 on a multi-million dollar uh, sale. That's awesome. And uh, all the money went into the checking account. Now I'm in my 30s. You have to do something, you can't retire. So you start Premier Business Bank. So I went back to school, actually. And I went back to school and because I never graduated from college. So you're kind of like, you know, while you're living life, you can go in a kind of a regular path. But what my mother told me is a start at the top and then work your way up. So I went to USC MBA program and pitched that my work experience. And luckily I was a cover of Fortune magazine that month. So a lot of people have seen my article 
and the dean of USC decided he's gonna work with me and um, have make an exception for me to be accepted at USC. So I jokingly said, maybe the only person who have multiple graduate degrees, including the doctorate, and I still don't have an undergrad. And my mom That's told- crazy. Yeah, and my so, mom said, don't tell anyone. <laughs> I have to tell you something. When we started Discus Dental, our business grew and grew and grew. And you know, we were at like 50, 60 million a year in sales. Yeah. I didn't understand anything that went on in the business meetings. Like I knew whitening, I, I knew, but the, so I went back to school also. I went to UCLA yeah. oh. to get business classes. Yeah. And I, I took night classes through the extension program and I learned what I needed to know because I thought, you know, it's not enough to just be a dentist. Like mm -hmm. I want to understand the business part here too. So we have such similar paths. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So it, what year did you start premium business bank? So that was my MBA thesis. I wanted to get an A. I didn't go to school to do anything. And you know, whatever you choose to do, you work really, really hard, right? And I saw people graduating with a yellow ribbon. And I asked, you know, the people, what is that yellow ribbon? And they said, that's an honorary degree. I mean, uh, that's an honor roll. So what's an honor roll? I never went to college, so I never been to college graduation. And they said, you have to be a top 5% to get the yellow ribbon. And I'm like, oh, shoot. If I don't get the yellow ribbon, my mom's going to kill me. <laughs> so I worked so hard. I didn't go to any of the, what is it, tailgate parties. You were at USC, the party central of, of the country. I right. did not do any parties. I was a nerd. I worked and worked. And So now, tell me about the business. What was the business? So I got to the finance class, and my finance professor was the home savings and loans person. All right, that was his background. And we were talking about corporate strategy on theme eight. And um, I saw such a niche. So again, it's going into the niche market that you understand and doing what you do really best, which was a compliance. So I went into uh, the corporate strategy and saw the multiple businesses were starting, community banks were starting at that time because they were doing so well. But there were really no bank that was focusing on a multi-ethnic groups because a lot of multi-ethnic groups have small businesses. And you know, just like your business was, it was very niche in the Beverly Hills and you targeted celebrities uh, to promote, but it was really for anybody who's interested in tooth whitening, right? And mine was kind of the same thing. We were focusing on the business people who really could not get the private banking experience when their business is about five, five million to about $50 million. A lot of big banks would not pay attention to these people. So we found those customers and started a commercial bank, business bank. So 2006 was the year that I launched. Remember 2007? Yes. Financial crisis. Yeah, big financial year, crisis. Worst year to start a bank. All and the way through to 2008 was still bad. Really bad. And the banking industry started crashing until 2010. All the banks were closing. And you know, a lot of banks had the bad loans. Luckily, we had no money and we had no loans, <laughs> right? <laughs> so 2010, it was like a bank of Sabrina. It kept raising more money, putting more money in. And then government took out all of our competition. So 2010, we started consolidating with other banks. And 2019, I was able to sell it to uh, First Foundation Bank. Wow. Okay, so all this is going on. And then Fremont College. Right. How did that happen? So after my MBA course, I loved school so much. You know, you're giving a like wine to a wine addict who never tasted wine before. <laughs> so I'm a learning junkie, but I've never got college degrees. So when I got an MBA, I was like on my 
you know, cloud nine. So I told my professor, who is my co-founder of the bank, um, that I had such a good time. I don't want to graduate. And he goes, Sabrina, you passed. You have to graduate. And I said, well, I don't want to graduate. And he goes, why don't you go and get your PhD? So I gave him a recommendation letter from Wharton. And he goes, you know, this is in Philadelphia, right? <laughs> and he said, and you know, I was kidding. And I said, I know it's in Philadelphia. I love your jokes. So he filled out the recommendation letter. I got accepted to Wharton. So now my mom says, you know, while you're at it, you're going all the way to Philadelphia, you should do more. So I end up doing another master's because you can, you know, transfer coursework to do another uh, master's. Of course you should do more. <laughs> <laughs> while you're at it, do more, right? Yeah. Uh, so I did another master's and that was a graduate school of education. And I saw this incredible need in the inner city, just like what you're doing to really raise the second generation of, especially in America, this is the best country in the world, number one economy in the world. And it's a crime if we look at our inner cities and right. the opportunities these kids do not have. So I thought about how can we make this work? And so you started your own college. I did. Fremont College. And where was it located? Downtown LA, right? So there are two campuses, downtown LA, and one is North Orange County called Cerritos. So there are two different towns. And uh, the, really the whole thing about it is again, you know, it's a thousand year old business education, but how do you modernize it? Because our students are changing. Well, not only how do you modernize it, but if I'm a student watching this and I say, okay, Sabrina, that was awesome. I want to start a college. Like, where do you start? What did you know about? Very I mean, carefully. <laughs> you, you had a little bit of, you know, background knowledge from the Art Institute. Right. But, you know, where would one learn how to do that? You know, what are the important things that somebody would need to know if they wanted to start a college? So there are like all businesses have kind of a barrier to entry right? You have to kind of see what that barrier to entry is. In, in the compliance business, barrier to entry, entry is really in the compliance. So to start a college, you have to get a license. You have to be approved by the state that you're going to be operating in. So for example, in California is a bureau for post-secondary schools. So BPPE is where you go to that website and there's self, so something called a self-study that you have to fill out. It's about this big. And uh, when you write that dissertation of how you're going to do it, what your product you have, then you can fill it, you know, complete it and send it. Unfortunately, while you are getting your approval, you still have to have your, your facility, you have to have your team, and you have to have everything. So that's very difficult to get started. But in my case, when you're starting out, like Art Institute, you have, you know, all the options. So, you, you know, and because I didn't have any experience, that was awesome. That time really gave me the preparation. So but how many students did you, what was your first year? With Fremont. Fremont College was 2007. For Fremont College, I didn't make a mistake of starting from scratch. I went and bought a shell. I thought so. Yeah, yeah. of a student at the college that already had accreditation because it takes like five years to, so two to five years to get an accreditation, right? So I bought a shell that was already accredited, had 57 students. And, and then, awesome. so your first year, you had 57 students. The next year, how, how much did it grow to? So the next year we had less because we changed the name. We got rid of all the programs and added different programs. So we had like 23 students left. And then after that, it started growing exponentially. So, you know, the college has done extremely well until the regulation came in. And then when the regulation changed, almost exactly same thing happened with what happened with a bank government changed the regulation in 2000, um, 2000, 
so 15 um, for the private colleges. So 2015 to 2017, about $40 billion sector became a $15 billion sector. Mm. All the schools closed. So again, when you are surviving and when you don't quit, it's very difficult to fail. Everybody quit, all the weak people quit. And when you don't quit, actually you're the last one standing or a few people standing in a battleground, there's always way out. So we were able to grow more in 2018 and 19, and I sold the college in 2020. So you had a big, big, big sale um, right before COVID hit. I mean, it yeah. was really fortuitous. You know, I know, I, I'm so sorry. I know you lost your mother and it was a really hard time for you, but you just decided to kind of clean house and your timing could not have been more impeccable. Yeah. Um, and so wh what are you doing now? So I am now um, being an investor and a board member of several companies. I feel like um, being a entrepreneur is like being a parent. You're giving a birth to 10 children at the same time and raising it at the same time. It's that difficult, but also that rewarding. Being a board member is, um, is like being a grandparent. <laughs> you know, you True. love your companies uh, so unconditionally and you see their good times and bad times. And during the good times, you're cheering for them. During the bad times, you're aching for them. But it's different than you're suffering yourself, right? Because you know they have to go through that struggle to be stronger. So I love um, being on the board of the companies that I really care for. And Is there any particular company that you're super, super excited to be working with right now that you're allowed to talk about? Yeah, there are two companies that I really love. One is called Mankind, and it was a billionaire philanthropist that Alfred Mann started um, to save diabetes. And um, he felt that diabetes patients have to inject insulin, and that's kind of crazy. So he, he had this technology to uh, inhale insulin powders because then you have a very, very quick reaction. You don't have to wait you know, hours to, for insulin to kick in. And a lot of the diabetes patients, you know, they have kind of like emergency situations. And my father has diabetes, so I know sometimes, you know, he has to just drink gulp of orange juice when, when the insulin is not controlled. So this is a great technology, great company. And because the technology was just only with use of insulin, now it's becoming a platform company. United is Therapeutics, and we have a um, actually a, a kind of like a collaboration to come up with a different type of insulin, I mean, uh, the powder inhalers. So oh, that's so exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting because, you know, injections and all of that is taking a long time and it's not, it's not. No, cool. that it makes so much sense. And I think the other one is called Yellow Brick. Yes, Yellow Brick is a online program for students who are interested in various creative careers. And they get to actually taste these careers before they're actually enrolled in the entire university program. And the courses that they graduate with can be transferred to different university like Parsons, um, different, you know, we have uh, a deal with Berkeley and a few other universities as well. That's awesome. Sabrina, you are amazing. You are, and thank you so much. I know you're a big supporter of LEAP. You came and you spoke at LEAP and the students still talk about it. They loved it. They called you the tiger woman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, if students want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Probably Instagram, because that's kind of like the only social media that I check. <laughs> And what is your Instagram handle? It's Dr. Sabrina K, D R S A B R I N A K A Y. Beautiful. Hey, thank you so much. And I will keep you posted. We're just putting together the program for LEAP 2021. So uh, we have to have you come back and speak again. Um, and and uh, I'll reach out and we'll put it together. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Bill, over and out. 
To learn more about the Leap Foundation, go to leapfoundation.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash leapfoundation or on Instagram at leapfoundation. Listen to the Meet the Mentor podcast with Dr. Bill Dorfman on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.